to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon and I'm the editor of Wet Pixel. I'd like to welcome you to this episode. And what I'd like to do today is to give a discussion and some background on a very important feature that we use on our cameras underwater the whole time, and that is the autofocus system. Now, um, it's very easy when we're getting caught up in, in camera choice and talking about camera choice to possibly get somewhat distracted. Um, and um, one of the things I think it's very important to stress about underwater, taking pictures underwater, is that if the image isn't in focus, essentially that means that, that image is, broadly speaking, useless to us. Um, if it's a bit underexposed or overexposed or possibly undersaturated or oversaturated, these are things that we can all fix to a greater or lesser extent in in post-production. Um, we can even up-res files if we've got low-res files. We can crop, obviously, to, to change compositional details and re-angle. So there's lots of things we can do. Obviously, we can't fix every photograph in post, but if, a cam if, a, if an image is out of focus in the critical areas of focus, um, essentially that image is no use. It's, it's going to end up being deleted. Now, to, again, to give this possibly a, a, a practical example, um, I typically on a big trip away would normally in the first cull, and this is, you know, this is my first kind of look through my images, probably get rid of somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of the images that were out of focus. Um, and it's straightforward image out of focus on critical focus areas like the, the eyes, if it's, a, if it's an animal obviously that, 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 that I'm focusing on, focusing on the eyes, um, foreground detail on a wide angle image, whatever it is that I need to make sure it's tight and sharp and focused. Um, I would say probably 10 to 15% of the images that I shot, I could cull straight away because they simply the focus point missed or a simple user error, I'd got it to focus in the wrong place. Um, the camera hadn't managed to deal with the focus situation, whatever it may be. Um, so that was quite straightforward. So, you know, on a thousand images, I'd be getting rid of somewhere between 100 to 150 of them on my first cull straight away. Scrolling forward to the end of 2016, um, I took a D500, Nikon D500 to um, Indonesia for a month um, and um, the D500 shares a, a focus system with the, the, the D5 which has been released at that point and subsequently the D850 which is which is obviously now uh, been released and the focus system has dramatically improved um, and that has that on that trip I think I shot somewhere in the region of eight to nine thousand images and I had a really really difficult first cull so I went from quite easily getting rid of, starting to narrow the pack down quite quickly to finding it much, much harder because quite simply, they weren't, they weren't, they were all in focus. Um, and that's not true. Of course, there were some that were out of focus. User error will always mean that there are some out of focus, but the vast majority of the images I took were in focus. And that was a huge, huge performance difference. Now, of course, that makes the first car much more difficult, but it does mean that obviously when I'm shooting images in the field, I'm more likely to get um, usable images than, than before. And ultimately, that's what it's about, particularly in the heat of the moment, you know, when something happens, it's quick, and we haven't got time to compose and so on and so forth and take our time with autofocus. The faster and the better the autofocus works, the more chance we have of actually capturing that moment, the peak of the action, as, as Martin Edge so eloquently puts it in his book. So that moment that we need the focus to be bang on, the better the autofocus works, the more chance there is that we'll be able to actually capture that, that moment. Okay, so, um, Broadly speaking, let's talk about how autofocus systems work. Um, autofocus is a relatively new thing. I mean, obviously, cameras have been with us for a long time, but autofocus itself um, was originally invented by Leica, or the concept was invented by Leica. Um, but certainly, Nikon have only had it on their cameras since the mid 80s, I think about 1986, something like that. So, you know, we're talking about a relatively new phenomenon. Um, and the, the original way of it's basically achieving autofocus is to basically for the camera to sense the distance from the subject and then that distance information to then allow it to adjust the lens to the correct optical distance. And maybe maybe I should revert back to how, what lenses do. Well, what lenses do is they have elements that move in and out and those elements allow the light coming in to be focused in different positions basically. So if a an, if, if an, uh, subject is further away, for example, the element may move further away um, in order for it to be in focus. A lens element may move further away, or alternatively, if the subject's closer, it may move closer in. So basically what you've got is you've got elements within the lens moving in and out, and those are adjusted effectively according to the distance from the 
and lens port, whatever it is that we, we, the subject is, is, is situated, is located in. Okay. So how does the camera know that distance? Well, broadly speaking, um, the most common technique now, and there are others, but I'm, I'm trying to distill this into a, into a simplified form, is something called phase detect. And what phase detect is, this is on SLRs, um, and basically what it is, is it has a, um, a beam splitter, so the light comes in, it gets split, um, and gets put through a translucent part of the camera's mirror, um, and then gets transmitted down to the autofocus sensor. So there's a separate sensor with, with, with um, mirrored SLRs. Um, and essentially it works a bit like our vision works. It's binocular vision. So by looking at different angles, we can determine distance. If you close one eye, it's hard to tell where the distance is. So um, it's the same idea. Essentially it's using bifocal uh, binocular um, vision or binocular sensing to be able to sense the distance. That information, that distance information is then relayed back via the, um, the um, camera's processor and then that adjusts the lens to suit um, to, to, to suit the distance that it's recorded. Um, so that's, that's um, what's known as phase detect. We then have contrast detect. And what's contrast detect? Well, contrast detect is on chip, so it's on the sensor. It's nothing to do, it doesn't have additional um, autofocus modules. So this is used, um, it, it has to be used on mirrorless cameras, on compact cameras, cameras that don't have a mirror that's moving. Um, and um, basically what this does is that the, the camera uses primarily software, an algorithm, to determine the sharp edges of a subject. So um, it looks at a subject, determines its edges, gets those edges as sharp as possible, and then converts it to a distance, which allows the lens to focus. So it's an on-chip, it's a software-based algorithmic process, um, and it, it doesn't need a separate mirror. Um, it certainly works, and this is probably a good point, when, when you have your camera in live view mode, your SLR camera in live view mode, it's now going to use um, contrast detect rather than phase detect. So contrast detect, as the name suggests, detects contrast within the image. Um, we also have variations on that. For example, um, Canon uses a technique known as dual pixel. Um, and this is a form of, of contrast detect where basically what you've got is you've got de dedicated contrast detect sensor uh, uh, photo sites on the sensor. So the sensor not only has imaging information being gathered on it, but it also has focus information. And again, it compares, in the case of that one, it compares different sides of the sensor to kind of create almost like a phase-like thing to try and create a binocular. But it notes it's all done electronically. It's not done in terms of converting it to um, to an optical signal, so from an optical signal. So it basically senses the two sides and compares them and determines the optimum focus distance on the result on the back of that. So um, we have broadly speaking then phase detect, contrast detect, contrast detect to a greater or lesser extent um, is um, sensor based, phase detect is primarily hardware based. Um, now some most or many SLR cameras will actually have both and that that introduces almost a well perhaps we should use a third element in that um, Nikon certainly and, and and many many other manufacturers have some kind of scene detect system built in and what the scene detect system uses it also uses things like color information so now it's using information obtained from the sensor to help as well so so it will start using color information and all sorts of things and certainly if you'd use in Nikon the 3d um, focus mode um, it will now start tracking using not only um, phase and contrast detect systems, but also will use some of this kind of AI, it's not AI, but this kind of um, algorithmic voodoo um, to basically try and track the subject across the, across the three. And, and to be fair, the 3D focus systems, the 3D focus system in Nikon is, is amazing. It, it, it does an amazing job of tracking um, even quite errant subjects through the frame. And of course, when we're underwater, even if the subject is moving, we often are. So, so it's, a, it's a possibly a good option to consider. Now, pros and cons. Well, um, to date, 
um, the phase detect systems um, possibly with the addition of things like contrast and 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 scene recognition systems um, is by far the most accurate and fastest um, I think um, many people would say that contrast detect is starting to catch up and it's true that contrast detect um, particularly in, in iterations like dual pixel CMOS and, and various other iterations like the ones that Sony are using are very good um, but it's also true to say that none of them are as good as you're getting currently in the face detect SLRs. Um, I haven't shot the Nikon D6 yet, um, and nor have I shot the 1DX Mark III. Um, I've shot um, D850, D5, and 1DX Mark II, so the three pinnacle flagship cameras. Um, and certainly, they're all very, very good. They're amazing, the focusing performance. I think of the, the, between the three of them, I would say D5 and D850 have the edge over the 1DX Mark II, but I haven't shot 1DX Mark III. Um, certainly, all of them, I would say, are significantly better than, for example, the current iterations at 5D Mark IV, Canon 5D Mark IV. Um, now, if we then sort of compare those to the um, cameras that are relying on contrast detect, and I'm aware this is subjective, but my experience is that I think we're probably looking about two to three generations behind. So, um, I would say that the um, certainly the uh, autofocus on the Nikon Z series cameras would be somewhere round about Nikon D800 performance, something like that. And also that's somewhat complicated because the um, progress of the, of the autofocus system within, within the Nikon family has not been linear. So, so it, was, it was a fairly steady curve, D800, D810, gradual improvement, and then D850, D5, there was a big improvement. So, so it's not fair to say, but I would say you're probably looking, yeah, what's that? I suppose that's that's two to three generations ago, um, D6 being the latest generation. Um, certainly what I hear about the D6 is the autofocus is better than that on the D5, and that, if that is true, there's probably a certain amount of confirmation bias around that, because people have just spent $8,000 on a new camera body, they're probably not gonna say it's autofocus sucks, but but I think, I mean, I, I, I would imagine it's probably pretty good, um, and I think, obviously, that assuming that progression, as soon as we see that that technology trickle into um, D860 or whatever the next model is, and D600, you never know, um, then I think we'll probably see a, a general improvement. Um, um, whether we manage to see those improvements um, transfer into mirrorless, as I say, the problem we have with mirrorless is that generally the technology of the phase detect is simply you can't do it because you haven't got a mirror. So um, we're relying on contrast detect, and contrast detect currently is not as good as face detect. Now, you know, these are all solutions that, that all the camera manufacturers are working at really hard, um, and I think um, there's no doubt that we will see improvements in the future. But as of right now, as of today, um, I don't think anyone would argue that the autofocus systems on SLRs are currently better. Now, which camera should I choose? Why Why should I choose an SLR? They're bigger, heavier, more expensive. They're old technology. Yep, all of these things are true. Um, but returning to my starting point, um, we can fix just about anything in post-production except for images that are in focus. So if your goal is to go out and achieve um, memorable images underwater, um, that is the one... Um, technical flaw that we can't fix in our images. Just about everything else we can repair in post um, in various different ways. But if it's, if it's not sharp, it's no good. And so in many ways, all of those things about size, weight, bulk, I'm afraid expense to some extent, has to be balanced against that one single factor. That if, if, if the camera's autofocus is better, you will come home with more images that you want to keep and look at and enjoy. And potentially publish and sell and all the other things that you may want to do with it. So for me, it's a bit of a no-brainer, I'm afraid. Um, currently, I'm going to stick with SLRs. Um, I fully expect that in the future, I'm probably going to be end up mirrorless, um, and that will probably be something that may be forced on me because the, the manufacturers have all seen the future as mirrorless, um, um, but we'll see. Um, but certainly, you know, that may be the future. But right now, I think that the autofocus advantages, particularly that we have with SLRs, make a compelling reason to stick with SLR for underwater use.
Um, I should stress these are my thoughts. I, I would imagine that there's some discussion. I'm quite happy to, to do that. I think that would be a good thing. Please feel free to, 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 to start a discussion about this in, in the, the WebEx forums or anywhere else. Um, um, I'd like to thank very much our sponsor for, for today's episode, which is Icolite Underwater Systems, who, who kindly supports us. Please feel free to like the video or possibly give what I said dislike. I don't know. Um, and um, also, of course, I mentioned adding comments on the forums. If you'd like to add comments below the video, that's also a great idea. Um, let's have a discussion about the pros and cons and what to focus on how they work. I hope it's been useful and I look forward to seeing you again soon.